Hello, folks. This is your host, Tammy Turner, and you are now listening to the Tierra Talk Show. We bring you rare interviews with the makers of Disney magic. Whether they be singers, actors, Imagineers, animators, they've all made their mark on the Disney name. To find out more about the show and other episodes, head to our official website at www.thetierratalkshow.com. Be sure to look below at the show notes in the show more section for links to our Twitter and Facebook pages, including videos and websites mentioned in the following interview. Photos and audio clips that are featured in the show belong to their rightful owners and are used for educational purposes only. All guests' opinions are theirs and theirs alone and do not represent the opinions of the Tierra Talk Show or the host. The Tierra Talk Show is not associated with the Disney Company. Thanks again for tuning in to this week's episode. And from all of us here at the Tierra Talk Show, have a hoop de doo day. I'm excited to welcome this week's Tierra Talk Show guest, former walk-around character actor for the Dream Finder from the original Epcot Journey into Imagination attraction, Ron Schneider. Welcome to the show, Ron. Thank you, Tammy. I'm thrilled to be here. Oh, I'm glad you're here. And, you know, I recently read your autobiography, From Dream to Dream Finder, A Life and Lessons Learned in 40 Years Behind a Name Tag. And you have an incredible history of working for the Disney Company. And I just was wondering, how many years in total have you been working for the company? And can you list some of your jobs that you used to work? Well, for Disney, I uh, the first job I had was I was in Wardrobe to shoot for the Christmas Parade at Disneyland in 1970. Um, then I was back in 1980 to 82. I was uh, understudied Wally Bogue in the comic lead, The Golden Horseshoe Review at Disneyland. Then from 82 to 87, I was the Dream Finder uh, for Epcot Center. And uh, when I left that, I, uh, while I was, went off to work in other parks, I did freelance work for Disney. I did some writing, did some voiceover work, uh, some video production for them off and on. And then um, came back in uh, 2006 and did uh, about two and a half years on the opening crew of Monsters Incorporated Laugh Floor. Uh, That's awesome! So, I did not know that. <laughs> that, that was uh, that was a lot of fun, quite an exciting project. And then, of course, beyond between that, I also was at Universal Studios. I was at Six Flags the Magic Mountain, a lot of theme restaurants. So, when I mentioned the title of the book is is Forty Years, uh, that includes all of the different theme park jobs that I had. What exactly inspired you to work for the Disney Company? Uh, well, it goes way back to my dad. Uh, the family owned a air conditioning company, and we did. Uh, my father worked on the air conditioning for Disneyland when it was under construction in 1954 and 55. So our family was there the day that Disneyland opened to the public. The first day that it was actually open was July 18th, after the grand opening, and uh, so we were there that day. Uh, just uh, my mother, father, my sister, and I, and uh, my grandmother, and uh, my mother remember looking around and saying, um, gosh, this is just beautiful. It's a shame that in a year it'll all be run down and, and dirty. Um, I grew up going to Disneyland, would go a couple times a year. It was always a major thing for me. Couldn't sleep the night before. And uh, it was always fascinating to me. And uh, watching uh, One World of Color uh, growing up, I never particularly cared for any of the uh, westerns or any of the serials, but if there was animation on, or better yet, if there was Walt Disney talking about Disneyland and how it was built and showing the, the parks, um, I was nailed to the TV screen. We didn't have VCRs back then, but I had my little cassette player and I would record the audio from the shows and uh, listen to that endlessly. So I grew up doing that and uh, kind of got it in my head that I wanted to live there to one, to one extent or another. But then in um, uh, 1970, I was in high school. I, well, actually what happens in 1966 when Walt passed away. It struck me what a tremendous effect he'd had on my life and um, what a tremendous influence he'd been. And next time I was at Disneyland, it struck me what, uh, that there was something going on here that was beyond people just going on rides. Now, by that time, I'd already been fascinated with puppetry and magic, and I'd been acting for a couple of years. And um, my fascination with theater kind of hit me while I was at Disneyland. I thought, this is theater. This is a giant stage, and we, as the guests, are the stars of the show. We're the actors stepping up on the stage and living out our fantasies in a real world, which felt what fascinated me. And I immediately started doing all the research I could into how Disneyland worked. I never particularly carried, uh, never collected Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck or animation cells or any of that stuff. I was fascinated with the history of Disneyland and how it 
evolved and how it worked, the principles behind it. And so I would write letters to Disney asking them questions about uh, how things worked. And um, in 1970, I was with a bunch of high school friends um, visiting the park. One day we decided to try and do everything at Disneyland in one day, see if it could be done. And we went into the Golden Horseshoe Review, which was a show that had been running at Disneyland since the day it opened in 1955. So by that time, it had been running for 15 years. Five and ten shows a day. It was listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as the longest running live stage show in the history of the world. And this was in 1970. And I saw Wally Bogue, who was the comic of the show. And I took one look at what this guy was doing on stage, and I said, I don't want to do that. I want to be Wally Bogue. And uh, so that became kind of a goal for me. And for the next ten years, I took every theme park job I could find. I studied everything about the kind of performing that Wally had done. He plays a traveling salesman in the show. I put together a traveling salesman act. He did balloon animals in the show. I learned to do balloon animals. And um, over those 10 years, I worked at Universal Studios and Six Flags Magic Mountain and uh, a couple of theme <laughs> restaurants. All in the back of my mind with Wally Bo standing in the back of my mind, goading me on. 10 years later in 1980, uh, it, was Walt, it was Disneyland's 25th anniversary and they were holding auditions for someone to come in and do the horseshoe show at night. They were going to have 10 shows a day at the horseshoe show, and they needed a new comic. And I walked in, got the job, because I'd spent those 10 years perfecting uh, my abilities, and I was able to walk in and show them what it is they were looking for. And uh, that started it for me. My dream had been to work at the Golden Horseshoe, and 10 years later, I got that. Uh, I've always believed, as a wonderful quote by... Uh, Richard Bach, he says, we are never given a dream without being given the power to make it come true. You may have to work for it, though. And uh, I'm living proof. I, uh, I got everything that I wanted uh, out of that dream and uh, went on to do a lot more in the 30 years that followed. So that's how I wound up at Disneyland and how I became fascinated with the company. And you got to work with Wally Bogue, too. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the Diamond Horseshoe? Uh, golden, golden horseshoe. The golden oh, horseshoe. I, why did yes. I say diamond? Sir? I'm sorry. <laughs> because because no, diamond I, horseshoe. People who are from the East Coast are going to know. That's the why horseshoe. I'm saying the diamond horseshoe. I'm, I really horseshoe. apologize. It's my fault. Tisk tisk on my part. Sorry. Yes, same, 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 same. It, it, it's funny because you say that I got to work with Wally Bogue, and that was the one sad thing about understanding Wally. It meant that I was there when Wally wasn't. It was always a magical thing to go to the Golden Horseshoe Review as a guest and see Wally Bogue, and Fulton Burley, and Betty Taylor. They were the three principals of the show. <laughs> and um, it was uh, when I got the job and I got to work briefly with Wally and training for the role. And then I was there when Wally wasn't. Now, he would call me sometimes the night before and say, listen, I'm going to the track tomorrow. Can you come in and do the show? And so then I would go in and I would uh, get to play. But... I didn't see Wally nearly as much after I got hired at the Horseshoe as I did before I ever got the job. Um, he was a, a consummate professional, um, always completely in the moment. He never, he never phoned it in in any respect, and I learned that from him. He was always there and always putting out a good show, no matter what was going on in his life or how he felt at any particular moment. Uh, he was very much all business off the stage um, he, by the time that... Uh, he came to Disneyland. He'd been uh, a world-renowned performer. Worked at the at, uh, he was on the Ed Sullivan Show, and he uh, studied and taught dancing all over the world. And um, uh, so he was a cosmic professional. The real fun was working with Fulton Burley. Fulton was the Irish tenor that did the show. He came in around 1962, and he was a real character. Uh, he was actually Canadian. Uh, put on an Irish dialect uh, on the show and did a lot of comedy for being a fellow who was supposed to be the male singer. He did a lot of comedy. And uh, Betty Taylor was um, every bit the lady that she was on stage. She was uh, very, very pure and very innocent in a sense and, and ran that, uh, the, the, uh, the dance line. The girls in the dance line were really her girls. And uh, she was uh, very, very professional, very serious about what she did. Um, I learned after a while that she... You know, she used to go out in the audience, she used to flirt with the guys in the audience and do comedy with people in the audience. She hated going out into the audience. She felt very uncomfortable with it. It was Fulton who taught her how to do that. He wrote the material that she did out in the audience and taught her how to go out there and have a good time with it, and she became quite good at it. So that was my experience at the Golden Horseshoe. It was a tremendous thrill to be a part of that tradition 
you know, I've, I've, I've always felt that in life, uh, one person in their life can't make that much of an impression, but if you can be part of a larger thing, like the Disney organization, or in my case, like the Golden Horseshoe, to know that I was a part of that tradition that ran for so many years. The show ran for, I think, uh, 33 years at Disneyland and entertained millions and millions and millions of people. And to know that I was a part of that and carrying on that tradition is something that uh, stays with me to this day. And they also had um, a special reunion show uh, at the Golden Horseshoe. Uh, did you get to go to that? Uh, no, but I saw it on uh, video and I wrote a, uh, a scathing review of what they did because it wasn't, see, the original show was a variety show. Walt Disney hired um, talent and trusted that talent and said, you put this guy, you guys put the show together. And Wally Bo and um, his crew put that show together. Wally was one of the directors of the show. And we were very much left to our own devices. And so the comedy was created by comedians. And the singers put the songs together. And uh, they brought in wonderful choreographers and wonderful arrangers. But we were very, very, very much left to our own devices, which is something Disney doesn't do now. Disney will script something to within an inch of its life. And that's what they replaced the Golden Horseshoe with. They got rid of the variety acts that were that consisted, you know, comprised the original show. And brought in a book show, which they called the uh, Golden Horseshoe Jamboree. Out here was a Diamond Horseshoe Jamboree. And that was a book show with uh, good, wholesome comedy that was primarily wholesome and not terribly funny. And uh, they had a much bigger cast, and people were knocking themselves out. A lot more singing, a lot more dancing, but the problem was that it didn't relate to the guests as much as that original show, which is the reason people still talk about and still remember and love that original show. Uh, when they did the tribute to the original Golden Horseshoe, they didn't do a tribute to the original Golden Horseshoe. They mentioned it one time in the evening, but what they basically did was a tribute to the Golden Horseshoe Jamboree, which was, again, a bunch of very hokey singing and dancing and stuff that really didn't relate to the audience and didn't uh, entertain many people. Um, That's this, very disappointing. Oh, this, this, this was um, my opinion. There are, uh, there are videos on YouTube. You can see that uh, Golden Horseshoe Tribute from Disneyland, and you can also, if you type into YouTube, Ron Schneider's final show, you will see an entire performance of the Golden Horseshoe Review. It was my last show that I did before I moved to Florida and became Dreamfinder. And the entire show's there. It's not uh, Fulton Burley and Betty Taylor. I'm doing the show with um, uh, Jay Meyer, who was uh, Fulton's understudy, and Terry Robinson, who was Betty's understudy. And they are both uh, people with the long histories with Disney as well. Jay Meyer is one of the singing heads in the Haunted Mansion. Wow. And a uh, terrific uh, Irish singer. He was on the old Jack Benny show and uh, uh, a real show business veteran. And you'll see my last show at the, at the Horseshoe, in the show in, in its entirety with the dancing girls and the whole thing. You said that you got to move down to Florida and work as the Dreamfinder, and you also got to record some of the Dreamfinder's dialogue and the attraction. So how in the world did that come about? I was... Uh, well, I was at Disneyland at the Golden Horseshoe when Wally Vogue retired, and uh, I was hoping to kind of get that uh, position of being a full-time replacement. I did not. Uh, but one of the advantages of working for Disney is that once you're inside, they, uh, you can network within the company, and they have let you know what's going on. And there was a presentation at the University of Disneyland by Tony Baxter, uh, who was at the time working on designing the journey to imagination. And he was going to come in and speak about... Uh, con uh, careers with web enterprises, what we now call Disney Imagineering. He, he was talking about what it's like to work at WED, and he showed us some uh, artwork about the project he was doing at that time. He held up a shot, uh, a beautiful drawing of Dreamfinder and Figment, and he mentioned that these are going to be the only characters at Epcot Center that will be known Mickey or Minnie Mouse. Um, Dreamfinder and Figment represent imagination, and he went on to tell us about them in great detail, and I, I had the same exact, same experience that I had the first time I saw Wally Bogue. I took one look at those characters and I said, that's what I want to do next. So I contacted a friend of mine, uh, Ken Lisi, ran the sound department at Wed Enterprises. And uh, we knew each other from back in our days at Magic Mountain. And I said, listen, I'm interested in doing this Dreamfinder character. Can you get me a recording of the Dreamfinder voice so that when I go in and, and do the, you know, tell them I'm interested in the character, I can do the voice for them so I can recreate it. Well, he gave me a cassette recording of the Dream Fighter voice, and I went off and practiced until I could recreate it. And I left a message on my phone machine, 
uh, after that uh, session. I said, Ron's off on a flight of fancy and won't be back for some time, so leave a message after you hear the talk. And I came back uh, the next day from work, and ten people had called and hung up without leaving messages. <laughs> but there was one message from Ken Lisi back at Red Enterprises saying, call me immediately, which I did. And uh, I thought to myself, wouldn't it be funny if all those people who were just calling to listen to the message were the Imagineers? And that's who it was. Ken had called me and said, you've got to hear this. And he played this for Tony Baxter and Exitensio and Barry Braham and all the people who had worked on the pavilion. Now, it turns out Chuck McCann did a wonderful job of creating Dreamfinder voice for the ride. He did the, all of the opening scene with the dream catching machine. It's a voice that's uh, loosely based on Frank Morgan, the Wizard of Oz, which is one of the reasons the ride did. The, the voice affects people so, so much to this day. But Chuck had recorded most of it um, for one reason or another, I'm not sure what. Uh, there were certain lines in the ride that he did not record. And they needed someone who could come in and match him. So the next day, I get a. I, find myself back at Wet Enterprises in a room with Exitensio, and they gave me some lines of dialogue to read, and I read them, and they put me in a recording booth, and I, I finished the ride. Uh, science and technology, and I was the dream finder up at the end of the ride, who's up on the camera crane, he says, Figman and I have enjoyed our journey into imagination. And from that point on, when they needed the, the dream finder voice in the park, I got the call. Uh, and that led to me being able to do other character voices uh, for the parks off and on. I do miss it a lot, <laughs> um, but I know that that you mentioned in your autobiography that you got to work on the television special Epcot Center, the opening celebration, and that aired on CBS October twenty third, nineteen eighty two, just the night before the uh, Epcot's official dedication, and you got to film a quick segment with young child star Drew Barrymore, who was just an ET at the time, and host legendary actor Danny Kaye, and I was very sad to read that your experience wasn't what you expected it to be. It was not the greatest experience getting to meet Danny Kay. I had grew up worshipping Danny Kay. I had several performers as a child who really inspired me to go into uh, this business, and uh, one of them was Danny Kay. I just found his stuff was amazing, and ever since I was a child, I always learned all of his patter songs, and, and whenever his films were on, I was nailed to the TV. Uh, one day I came back to my hotel room shortly after I moved out to Florida, and there was a script, big, thick television script, sitting on my hotel room bed saying, Ron Schneider, Dream Fighter, and I open up and find out that I'm going to be playing the scene with my idol. And uh, we shot this uh, on October 1st, as a matter of fact, it was the first day that the park was open. Uh, I, did the, uh, uh, I did a live interview with Brian Gumbel for the Today Show, and uh, then went straight over to Imagination and uh, shot the scene with uh, Drew Barrymore and Danny Kaye. Both of these clips, by the way, I'm rather embarrassed to say, are on YouTube, and you can see them. It was, please bear in mind, they were my first day of ever doing the character in the parks, and it's very raw. I'm not pleased with the way the character looked. The beard was a mess and all that, but the, there it is. It's out there forever. Uh, but Danny was um, a little brusque with people. Uh, he, this is, uh, of course, late in his career, and um, Danny Kay had been very much a type cast throughout his career as the kind of minstrel uh, funny man that he portrayed so brilliantly in those early films, but he was an actor of incredible range and could do so much more. Um, but I think his career was mismanaged to a certain extent. I think it made him bitter. And um, this kind of came off in the way that he uh, dealt with the public and um, kind of the way that he dealt with me and Drew, who was, of course, absolutely charming. Uh, what a sweetheart she was. Okay, so he was mean to Drew, too? Um, not mean so much as brusque, you know, oh. kind of kind of abrupt. Yeah, he 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 played that charming part uh, absolutely brilliantly. Uh, the sadly, uh, the whole way that he, he treated everyone at whenever he did the TV specials at Disneyland uh, or Florida, uh, this was the case, and uh, this is one of the reasons why the Epcot Center special was the last one that he did for Disney. The next uh, television special about the parks was hosted by John Forsythe. Uh, mm -hmm. Danny did a lot of stuff at the parks, but uh, finally, it's just kind of caught up, caught up with him. Well, now, now let's talk about some happy experiences with some celebrities you got to meet, because oh. one of them, obviously, is Michael Jackson, because Captain EO. 
That's a big thing. It's right next to the Journey into Imagination Pavilion. So you were requested to wait and to meet him. I, yeah, I was up on a break uh, between sets upstairs. I got a call uh, on the phone saying uh, that uh, Michael Jackson's downstairs. He wants to meet the Green Finder. So I, I threw on the dragon. There was, uh, I had a door that opened right into the garden area, which I opened and found the garden area was deserted. They had roped off the entire uh, uh, picture-taken garden. Uh, upstairs and, and out in the upper level of the uh, of the pavilion, and um, the only person standing there was in the middle of it was was Michael Jackson, and uh, so I walk over with Figment, and um, he uh, he looked terrific, had his sunglasses on, you know, very sharp. Now the thing about it was, uh, coincidentally, the night before was the world premiere on MTV of the music video for Thriller, and um, so after we talked and, and uh, he utterly charmed with Figment, um, I said, by the way, we saw the, the video uh, on last night on TV. And he suddenly, he got very serious, and he took the sunglasses off and said, didn't you think it was a little, it was dark, it was the photograph too dark? I said, no, I think I think that Landis wanted your eyes to pop out. And uh, so just kind of out of the darkness. And he goes, you know, you're right. That's it. So that was, that was my basic conversation with Michael. Michael, um, of course, always spent a lot of time in the parks. And uh, we found out later that when he was in Epcot Center, he would come into our dressing room uh, after hours and would use it as a break area to get away from uh, you know, the mobs. Uh, we had a little room upstairs in the Image Works, was right behind the electronic philharmonic, had a lock on the door which uh, the old Dream Finders had a key to, and so did security. And so he would come in, and uh, we had a little, we had a big makeup, makeup table with lights around him. We had a, uh, a couch and an easy chair. And so we found out that he was using, using that as a hideaway. So we kind of redecorated in his honor. We had to put up a big photo, a uh, big poster for Captain EO, but we cut his face out and put a poster of Howard the Duck <laughs> just, uh, just for it. For his benefit. Did he ever, like, make a scribble of a mustache on Howard the Duck's face? <laughs> no. He never, <laughs> uh, we, ne we never heard any reaction from him. <laughs> I'm sure he was very happy with that. That's, that's like, the most sincerest form of flattery when you're being made fun of. <laughs> that's really funny. Do you still have the poster? Uh, no. Darn. Oh. All that stuff. That stuff uh, continued to live in the dressing room after I left. I only was there as Dreamfinder for the first five years of the character, uh, from 82 to 87. I got to meet him once. I, I just found yeah. a photo of me meeting um, uh, the Dreamfinder. Uh, what year was it? Mm, 97. What, when was the last year? 98? 97? 90, 98. 98 was last year. It must have been the the end of 97. And I could not believe it because I, I was just looking through my photo albums. You can't even see my face because my mother's head is in the way. <laughs> but uh, it's clearly me with my little purple jacket. Dreamfinder's bending down so I could see Figment. What was your favorite part of the original attraction of Journey into Imagination? Well, I love the dream catching machine. It was just a marvel. Uh, the first time I ever saw that, that scene that's on the turntable, uh, was when I went to uh, White Enterprises to pick up that cassette record, uh, recording that my friend had for me. Uh, I met him in the lobby at WED, and uh, I thought he was just going to hand me the cassette and I was going to go home. He said, no, 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 come with me. And he took me back through the offices, back to the warehouse area where they did all the construction, and walks me into this huge dark room, and there was the dream catching machine with the dream finder on it. The whole thing was propped up on a couple of saw horses. And it was all hooked up to computers. They had just finished programming that first scene. And um, he introduced me to Tony Baxter and Barry Braverman, and they pushed a button, and I got to watch the entire scene play out there in the warehouse. Then when I moved to Florida, uh, I got there in uh, middle of September, and the ride didn't open until March of the following year. And so all those intervening months... I was at the Imagination Pavilion, and I would take at least one break a day, and I would walk through the ride and watch the construction going on. And uh, the turntable scene with the dream catching machine it was just a marvel. I mean, you had this giant turntable, and there were five copies of that scene on the turntable. There were five dream catching machines, five dream finders, five pigments, all the special effects, everything was set up 
uh, uh, on an amazing scale, and I would walk around the perimeter. There was a carpeted road that went around the perimeter, and it was like uh, it was like running through the Flintstone house. You know what I mean? In other words, the background just just was the same background. Over and over. <laughs> Um, watching that scene play out was always, for me, a lot of fun, and, and I never tired of watching it. There were so many special effects in that scene, and they didn't all always work, but there was so much going on in that scene that, they, that, that it, when I was watching it, I got to the point where I could finally figure out, well, this isn't working today, or this isn't working today on this particular stage. The whole, the whole flying machine would move up and down in reaction to what the scene was doing. When it got struck by lightning, it dropped, and uh, when it, it would go up very slowly and kind of roll with the, with the breeze. It was a very subtle thing. It didn't always work. Um, the smoke rings and the, the, the lighting effects, it was just astounding, the complexity of that scene, what they managed to cram in there in, in about four minutes. So that was one of my favorite things. Of course, I loved hearing my own voice coming out of the audio animatronics. <laughs> uh, that's an that's a incredible thrill. And um, one time I went to the right, I, I mentioned this in the book, I went to the right and there was this beautiful low-lying fog that was throughout the entire ride and it had never been there before. This is, I'm talking about a year or two years after the ride had opened. I went in there one day and there was this beautiful low-lying fog and this, the effect was, because with the ride you could see the track, you could see the, the, the walkway by the track, but you could see that when this fog was there. And so the whole effect was like floating along through this amazing dream. And I found out that there were 36 fog machines concealed throughout the attraction that were supposed to be running all the time. But the fog was um, a special Disney copyrighted uh, patent thing that was created completely out of water. There were no chemicals involved. It was just a special water nozzle that would fill the area around with fog. And it was glorious, except that being a water-based fog, all the sets were painted with water-based paint. And if they had kept that fog running the way they were supposed to, they would have had to repaint the entire ride. Wow. <laughs> but as I stated earlier, um, I really do miss the upstairs pavilion. But I wanted to know what your favorite activity to do upstairs was. I love the stepping tones. I thought that was a wonderful thing. That was after you went through the rainbow corridor, you went through a couple of different darkened rooms, and one of them had these uh, different colored squares on the carpeting that when you stepped on them, they played musical tones. And um, they were all arranged to be harmonic. The different clusters would all harmonize with each other. But there was only one melody that you could actually play. And um, when you first walked in, there was a set of tones to your right. And if you stepped on them in the right sequence, they played the musical theme from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I enjoyed all of the image works, but the thing that people forget about the image works, uh, the people who miss it as much as we all do, is um, it was 1982 technology. And the fact of the matter is that there's just about nothing in what was in the image works then that you can't do with a cell phone now. That's true. It's, it's uh, all the technology is completely caught up. I mean, it was a revelation back at the time. But... Uh, as much as everybody's craving to bring bring back that pa that piece of the past, um, if you've got if you've got a smartphone, you've got the image works in your hip pocket. Now we have to talk about changes. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, when was the first time that you heard Disney was going to refurb the Imagination Ride, and what was your initial reaction to it? I'm going to guess it was bad, but <laughs> um, my initial reaction when I hear anything's going to change is always a hopeful one. I never assume that they're going to take a, it's going to take a turn for the worse um, because these are the imagineers and i'm and i trust the imagineers and i'm very hopeful that they're going to when they're going to make a change you know it's like when they changed out the enchanted tiki room they the first thing we heard was going to be called under new management well under new management means there's going to be an improvement you know and so i, I was excited about what they're going to do yes i'm i'm a purist and i love the original enchanted tiki room and i it kills me if they took out the uh, the classical music at Disneyland, that was a glorious moment that only Walt Disney would have the nerve to put in there saying, we're going to have a moment where you're just going to sit quietly and listen to classical music in the middle of your day at Disneyland. That's a brilliant thing. And it was a moving, touching moment. Um, the uh, So I heard, I think like most people, I heard that it was going to change after it changed. They closed it. Oh. And, oh my God, they closed it. They came in and um, they booted the Dream Finder and they're going to put in a whole new ride. And I thought, well, you know, Terrific. And then I went and saw it. 
And um, I couldn't understand it. I couldn't understand why they did what they did. Uh, I know that things are never, uh, we never know the truth of what's going on at Disney. No matter what Disney tells us, we never know the truth of what's going on at Disney. I will never know the true story of why they got rid of the original ride. I've heard many explanations, including Marty, Scar Marty Sklar saying it was Kodak. Kodak, well, Kodak wanted to change. But um, there's always more to the story about what's going on, because this is a large organization. There's a lot of money involved. There's a lot of personalities involved. Um, I have a friend of mine who, when I worked with at Magic Mountain, he always wanted to be an Imagineer. Now he's one of the senior ma Imagineers uh, with Disney. And um, he, uh, he worked on the redo of Imagination. I had lunch with him in 2010. And um, I haven't seen him in, in years and years and years. And we met for lunch in California. And before we even sat down, he said to me, Ron, I have to tell you something. He said, I worked on the redo of imagination. And I'm very, very sorry. And I said to him, listen, I know it's not your fault because these things go through committees and they, 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 they rarely uh, wind up the way that they're originally designed. You know, it's, it's um, I think the, the thing that, the, the glorious things that Tony Baxter has uh, managed to put into the parks have benefited from the fact that Tony's followed through doggedly diligently to make sure that they didn't fall apart halfway through. You know, that they, they hung on to the original idea and they, the art of the theme park is dealing creatively with operational realities. Those operational, operational realities consist of many things. Budget, uh, committees, executives, public tastes, PC rules, all that stuff. And you have to deal with that creatively. You have to keep an eye on what your original intention is. And if you find that you can't accomplish your original intention, you have to adapt and, um, and deal with it creatively. And that's what Tony Baxter always did. I was, I was heartbroken to see what they did with it. Then they brought Figman in. I was heartbroken all over again that they, uh, Figman was turned into a pest. He was turned into a stock character. And that's an easy stuff to write when you're, when you're writing for a character like that. Somebody says, here, in the character, write something that's going to fill for, you know, 12 minutes. The easiest thing to do you know, is to say, is to treat him like a pest. Say, what are you doing here? Get out of here. And it comes off as being wacky. But see, the, the reason that we are sitting here talking about imagination is because of the care and the love of what Tony Baxter and his team put into that original ride. It was the way that Figment was born in front of us, the way he was treated and loved by Dream Fund, the way that we identified with him at the end of the ride, the message of what the ride is about, in, especially in the context of all of Epcot Center, that is something that stays with the audience and has carried it through. The same way that the reason people are so loyal to the Disney organization nowadays is because of what Walt Disney did prior to 1966. And that stays in our hearts and brings us back to the parts in spite of the fact that 50% of the time, they don't quite get it right. Yes. Like, you know, they, 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 50% of the stuff they produce is brilliant. It's a home run. Say, they'll tear your hearts out. I love the Little Mark ride. I love the new mind training. Uh, but when it comes down to it, I believe that um, I've always had faith that behind locked doors, somewhere at Imaginary, there's a hell of a uh, Dream Finder ride. But as long as we keep buying it in new franchises, it's going to keep getting shoved down the list of priorities. Yes. And we've got to have, now we've got to have a Frozen ride in Norway. And no, we've got to have a, no. star, <laughs> have a Star Wars land. And we've got to have Avatar. We've got to have all these things. And I'm hopeful for them, too. And I'm excited about all of them, too. But the thing is, every time one of these is announced, I keep imagining my poor imagination pavilion going further and further down the list of priorities. On a special day on May 15, 2011, Dreamfinder made a special appearance at Epcot woohoo! at Destination D at Walt Disney World, and he got to sing One a Little Spark with Richard Sherman. And I cannot even imagine the energy you must have felt while you were there and in full costume and reprising the roles. It was, it was the bracketing of a career, you know. It was the, the, the perfect wrap-up to a 40 years in, uh, in themed entertainment. And, uh, and it was not... Um, you said we have the fans to thank, and the, the fact of the matter is we have primarily one 
fan to thank. There was one man who was working with uh, the Disney archives and D23, whose idea it was. And um, he, uh, this guy worked tirelessly behind the scenes to put this thing together. Kept it a secret from everybody because he knew that there was going to be all kinds of political uh, machinations and opinions and stuff like that. And even I, when I first heard the idea, told him, it's never going to happen. There's no way we're going to make this work. But... Um, <laughs> But a lot of a lot of terrific people came together and pulled it off. And uh, to uh, see the reaction, to walk out on that stage, the front row uh, of that night with had Tony Baxter and uh, Exitensio and uh, Bob Gurr and uh, all the people who had built Epcot Center. Uh, Dave Smith, my good friend Dave Smith from the archives, was there, and, and they were as much a surprise as anybody. And I walked out, and there was. There were tears and people standing and cheering and people rushing up to the stage. The, the video uh, was actually shot by a fan who took advantage of the fact that um, you know, they have all these people in the audience who were making sure nobody was filming. But this one particular fan took advantage of the fact that everyone's attention was on stage. And so he filmed and uh, managed to get it up on YouTube. And it's still up there, um, I'm pleased to say. It was a remarkable moment for me, too. But you go back to that day when at uh, Red Enterprises when he first showed me the, um, the dream catching machine scene and then we sat down we had a long talk uh, him and me and Barry Braverman who also worked on the uh, image works we talked about the characters and we talked about their history and their purpose and their motivation and their inspiration and um, I always considered that tremendous gift that Tony had had given me and um, I had uh, I had the Figma puppet and um, there had been talk some talk about doing this again with uh, Dreamfinder Figment, and I, I decided I didn't want to do it again. I, that I, we had peaked, it was a surprise to everybody, and so um, I, uh, that's why I presented to Tony that night. And uh, it turns out that the Figment uh, reappeared at, the, um, at D23 this last time, the night that they uh, honored Tony and made him uh, a legend. Uh, the uh, Dreamfinder, uh, Steve Taylor, uh, did the honors that night. Uh, he was he was Dreamfinder for fifteen years. He was the one who did it the longest. What exactly do you think uh, Dreamfinder and Figment are up to now? Um, they're eagerly awaiting the uh, the comic book coming out to see how. <laughs> I know Dreamfinder I can't wait to see his origin story because that's what it is. The reason the reason you see that beautiful artwork where Dreamfinder looks so young is because the story goes back to before he met Figment, before he mm -hmm. created. Figment. It's all about his origin, and Figment comes in uh, down the road a little bit, and it's a wonderful, wonderful story that they've created. Um, I've read a little bit about it. There were some online interviews with Jim Zub, and, I, and I'm, I'm as excited as anybody to see what they're going to do with it. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just going to be a lot of fun, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if it led to something for the characters. I'm actually quite hopeful. If it's going to be a comic series, and we already have Iron Man and Captain America... Ooh, what do you think? Dreamfinder in the Avengers 2 or 3. Oh. <laughs> uh, they could kick some butt. I know they could. <laughs> so I have uh, three more questions for you. Um, they're called our Fab 3 questions. They're the Donald, okay. Goofy, and Mickey questions. So we'll start off with the Donald question. So as a child, what Disney film would you always like to watch over and over and over again? I was always madly in love with the story of Peter Pan. Um, Me too. And, yeah, yeah, that uh, and and all, and and most of its variation. But uh, there's a wonderful book let me, that I'd like to recommend to uh, your listeners. It's the official sequel to Peter Pan. It's the one that was uh, uh, created uh, in response uh, to the hospital, uh, the Great Ormond Street Hospital in England, that uh, J. M. Barry wrote Peter Pan for and gave them the, uh, all the rights to. Um, it's a book called Peter Pan and Scarlet, um, and I encourage people to, to read it. It's a wonderful, wonderful follow-up. It is completely original. Uh, it's, it's not a prequel. It's a sequel, and it's um, just like the story of Peter Pan itself. It's very dark. Um, Peter Pan has always been a tragic figure as the boy who couldn't grow up. Yes. And um, this story is just charming and dramatic as anything you've ever read. And there's a wonderful audio book of it read by Tim Curry. No and um, 
the first time I listened to it, uh, I had the audio book and I would listen to it in my car. And I, I would drive down the freeway with tears running down my face because it was so beautiful. Um, so I want to recommend that to everybody, Peter Pan and Scarlet. But I'm a tremendous fan of Peter Pan and I always have been. What Disney character, besides Dreamfinder and any that you've already previously played, do you think would be your best friend if you met them in person? Wow. And we can't choose Figment. <laughs> oh, well, I've, I've had it, frankly, you work with him for five years. You'll get enough of Figment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I used to say that to people. People say, it, 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 he's so cute. And I'd say, oh, you don't have to work with him. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, well, who would be my best friend? Wow. Uh, and and it's, 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 there's a long list. Um, <laughs> who, do, who do you pick? Um, I don't, I really don't. This is a tough one. This is a tough one. I'm, but the, my, I mean, my first crush was the fairy godmother. Okay, and now we'll go into the Bicky question. Right. If I asked you to name any Disney song at this very moment, not including uh, the Imagination song, <laughs> what immediately comes to your mind? See, that's... The, see, the, the, I know, I did so mean to say that, but... No, just, no, just... no, no. It's, it's mean because we've all been inundated with this one particular song. I know. Us, and I'm sick to death of this one particular song. <laughs> and so, you know, the first thing that jumps into my mind is this one particular song. So we're going to ignore that one particular song, okay? We're going to pretend that the, the, the cold bothers me, and I'm going to go past that. I'm going to find something else. The song that I grew up with that I always loved was the Spectrum song, which was, for those of you who don't remember, Ludwig von Drake sang it on, I believe it was on one of the uh, Wonderful World of Color shows, mm -hmm. and the song goes red, yellow, green, red, blue, 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 red, purple, green, yellow, orange, red, and the, then he goes through all about the different colors. And uh, Paul Fries did a wonderful job of vocalizing it. There's a lot of terrific songs uh, and so much glorious music. Uh, I vastly prefer Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow to Now Is The Time. Me too. I'm on that, I'm on that boat with you. Absolutely. All the way. But there's, there's so much terrific music. Uh, oh, Colors of the Wind also. <gasps> yes. Touches me like nobody's. The first time I heard it, I went, my God, what a brilliant lyric. Thank you so much, Ron, for coming on the show. I had This is so much fun to talk to you, and, and I want listeners to definitely be sure to check out Ron's website at DreamFinder, which is D-R-E-E-M. From Dreamer to DreamFinder uh, website is still there, but I haven't been adding to it. I have another website called Theme Park University, okay. um, which uh, I used to write for. I don't write for it nearly as much. My partner, um, Josh Young. There's wonderful articles about the themed uh, entertainment industry, but there's a lot of stuff up there that I have written. The, the name of the book is From Dreamer to Dreamfinder, um, it's a, and it's available on Amazon. There's an audio book. You get to listen to me talk for nine hours. Uh, there's uh, electronic versions. It's at Barnes & Noble and all the different sites. But you can also, if you go to my publisher site, uh, Bamboo Forest uh, Publishing, um, you can order an autographed copy, and I'll personally autograph one and send one out to you. And also, I have to, I have to plug... Um, my publisher, Leonard Kinsey, has written a new book, and with all we've been talking about, about uh, old Disney versus new Disney and some of the things that need to be corrected in the company, he's written a new book called Habst, H-A-B-S-T, which is about that very thing. It's about um, the, what uh, what's going on at Disney and how things have changed and how things could be in this wildly incredible story. Uh, get changed for the better. Uh, I just finished reading it, and um, the only, it's a measure of how terribly impressed I am that I'm, that I, that I'm plugging it now. Uh, guys, I haven't talked to Leonard about this at all, but it's just, it's very bizarre, very funny, very, very out there, and uh, what they do to the Enchanted Tiki Room and the Journey into Imagination and the Leave a Legacy pylons and all that stuff is just amazing. That's great. I'm going to definitely check that out as well. Listeners, uh, if you want to comment below on some rides that you think uh, should not have been changed or their update wasn't the greatest and you thought it should have been different, please comment below and let us know. Ron, again, thank you for coming on the show. Would you be able to sing us out? I'll be happy to. One little spot of inspiration is at the heart of all creation, right at the start of everything that's new. One little spot 
lights up for you. <laughs> imagination, imagination, a dream can be a dream come true with just that spark. In me and you. <laughs> and you never know what kind of figment you may come up with. Oh, here's my favorite. <laughs>